This is the second video to accompany discrete mathematics and functional programming. I'm Thomas Van Drunen. In this video, I will talk through some of the ideas found in sections 1.1 through 3. This has the stated goal of introducing the concepts of set and element. But one reason why I like to start with this is that it provides an intuitive entry point to discrete mathematics as a whole. It's an appropriate way to contrast discrete math with calculus and pre-calc, which I would expect is the most recent mathematical experience for most of you. I need to give credit for a lot of the content of this presentation to my high school math teacher. He began every school year, whether the class was algebra and trig or pre-calc or calculus, with a quick review of all the math we had seen in our lives up to that point. And he structured the review around our expanding knowledge of kinds of numbers. When I started teaching discrete mathematics and computer science, it struck me that this is the perfect way, or at least the perfect entry um, into discrete math as well. So imagine how a child begins to be aware of quantities and numbers. I have young children at home, so this might be easier for me. But at some point, a child learns to count. One, two, three. Then he or she figures out that at some point there is some um, regularity, a regular pattern for determining the next number in, in the uh, in this series, uh, such as once you get past 12, 13, 14, 15, we see some regularity. Um, and then uh, the child learns how to deal with multiples of 10, 20, 30, 40, and then eventually he learns to count up to 100 and finds the pattern for forming numbers larger than 100. I hope you remember that we have a name for all of these numbers. We call them the natural numbers. When you started school, you began learning things about the natural numbers, especially things that you could do with them, like adding and subtracting. You also needed to accept zero as a number. Uh, which we should admit, it's not obvious. It's something that has to be has to be learned and accepted. Moreover, I hope that you remember that if we include zero, we have a different name for the collection. We call these the whole numbers. So we can visualize it this way. The inner circle here stands for the natural numbers, such as five, and the label that we give to the natural numbers is a uh, script capital N. Uh, the whole numbers make a broader category comprising all the natural numbers plus one, plus one particular element, namely zero. Um, we use script W for uh, that entire collection. So what I want you to note is that N and W here are not variables that can stand for any number. They are in fact constant symbols that stand for uh, the entire collection, which they stand for. Uh, also notice that the size of these circles is meaningless. There is an infinite number of numbers packed into the inner circle. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, dot, dot, dot. But the area uh, of the outer circle, not including the inner one, contains exactly one item, namely zero. The important thing is we have a broader category that completely contains the subcategory. Now, as you learned more about what to do with numbers, you began to see that they were not sufficient to capture everything in human experience, that so we would like to use numbers to describe. What I mean is that even though if you take two whole numbers and add them together, you will always get another whole number as an answer, subtraction doesn't work out as nicely. What's 12 minus 17? We consider that to be a problem with our number system. And the solution is to invent new numbers. In this case, we need negative numbers, of course. More specifically, whole numbers, together with their opposites, constitute what we call the integers, uh, conventionally labeled with a script capital Z. Now we can add, subtract, and multiply without leaving the realm of integers. In technical language, the integers are closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Division is a different story. What are the results of division when the divisor doesn't divide the dividend ev evenly? 
Well, our language is already equipped to talk about things like that. We have words like half. Uh, but mathematically, we need fractions, or some equivalent way of denoting the rational numbers. So that gives us a new category with a script Q as a label. Uh, to be clear, recall that the rational numbers are those that can be expressed as a ratio or a fraction of two integers. So that includes all the integers themselves, since they each can be written as, for example, 5 over 1. Hence, rational numbers um, is a category encompassing all the categories we've talked about yet, uh, plus a whole lot more, of course. Now we can divide any two rational numbers with, uh, without a problem. Uh, we can get a, uh, um, a, a, another rational number as the quotient, with one exception. Uh, division by zero is still undefined, but since we're not going to solve that problem, we're going to move on. Now, let's say you've gotten to geometry. That introduces a bunch of problems analogous to the ones we've just seen. Uh, say you have a unit isosceles right triangle, like the one you see on the left there. What's the length of its hypotenuse? I hope you remember the Pythagorean theorem and uh, could say root 2, even if it weren't there on the screen. Um, but uh, as another example, say that you have a circle with unit diameter. Uh, what's its circumference? Well, you, you know that pi is the ratio of any circle's circumference to its diameter, so if the diameter is 1, then the circumference is just pi. The problem is, root 2 and pi are not rationals. There do not exist integers whose ratios comprehend either root 2 or pi exactly. Yet, these uh, quantities clearly exist in the real world, so what do we need? We, we need a new category. We need real numbers. Uh, we can keep playing this game with more advanced information. For example, you might remember that uh, some real numbers, uh, including all rationals, can be found as roots to polynomial functions with integer coefficients. We call uh, numbers like that algebraic numbers. And they appear right here uh, with, uh, on the right side of um, the realm of real numbers. And I've labeled that with a script A, which is not conventional, but makes sense in this context. And those numbers that cannot be found as root of polynomial with all um, all integer coefficients, we call transcendental numbers. Now don't feel bad if you didn't remember that distinction or if you don't understand it now either. Uh, if it was ever mentioned in your high school class, it would have been only in passing. And the distinction itself isn't that important for us right now. The only thing that's uh, really important to observe is that there is a distinction. And in this case, that distinction cuts through the reals completely with no overlap. We have within the category of real number that subcategory algebraic number, which includes all rationals, integers, whole numbers, and natural numbers. And we have opposite that, the category of transcendental numbers. Next, uh, note that negative numbers, or negative real numbers to be precise, cuts across all of the other number categories we've mentioned, except for whole numbers and natural numbers. None of those are negative, of course. Finally, having negative numbers in our number system presents a problem. Uh, negative numbers don't have real square roots. Well, what do we do about that? Well, no problem. We just invent complex numbers to deal with that. And now our review of number categories is complete. So what's new here? Well, not much, at least not if you remember what you learned in pre-calculus. Uh, but here's the difference. In your earlier math courses, you were interested in the contents of these categories, doing things with numbers. Now we are going to be concerned with the categories themselves, and not just categories of numbers, categories of anything, and operations that can be applied on categories, as opposed to operations that can be applied on numbers. For example, uh, notice that we can say a lot of things about these number categories. If you read through this list here of uh, assertions, propositions, as we would call them. Uh, you can find these in section 1.2. Uh, and you can also take a little time to convince yourself 
that each of these things are true. Along the right column, you'll see each of these assertions uh, stated in symbolic form. So the text you see on the left and the symbols you see on the right are equivalent to each other, just a, a verbal versus symbolic way of expressing the same idea. And uh, the reason I, I have added the symbolic representation here, even though we haven't yet talked about what those symbols mean, is that they're mainly there so that the symbols will look familiar when we do introduce them formally in section 1.4. Uh, but you likely have seen at least some of uh, these symbols before. And you can start to guess their meaning now by seeing them in context. Here's the important thing. You'll notice that uh, the nouns in all these sentences are either things like five or three-seventh or zero, something along those lines. Or they are things like script N, script Z, script W. So I've been calling the former things, uh, 5, 3, 7, through 2, etc., uh, calling them numbers or items, and the latter things, uh, script N, script Z, etc., I've been calling them categories. But the right terms to use are elements and sets. And I wish I could give you a precise definition for uh, element and for set. After all, I said last time that formal definitions constitute an important theme in this book, but I can't. Uh, there are two simple ideas to define. We call things like these primitive terms. So if you think back to geometry in high school, you'll remember how important the terms point, line, and plane are. And we have intuitive ways to think about point, line, and plane. Specifically, we can think of a dot or uh, a taut string or a tabletop. But uh, you may remember that geometry doesn't begin with precise definitions of these things. Instead, you'll remember that the relationships among primitive terms in geometry are described using postulates or axioms. People who do set theory carefully also start with a set of, of axioms, but a full axiomatic system is a little beyond our scope here. You can take a look at two axioms to see what it would look like, however. So the first of these two axioms, labeled as existence, namely, there is a set with no elements, uh, merely asserts that there is such a thing as an empty set. The second, which is commonly called the axiom of extensionality, uh, if every element of a set X is an element of a set Y, and every element of Y is an element of X, then X is equal to Y. That says that if we have two sets with exactly the same elements, then they're really the same set. In other words, the order of the element doesn't matter. Thus, we can define a set as an unordered collection of elements. That's still an informal definition, though. And elements, well, elements can be anything, so we won't define that any further than that. The last thing to mention is a little bit about basic notation. You can describe a set by listing its elements separated with commas between two curly braces. We have a special symbol for the empty set, uh, which you can see here, but we can also express the empty set with a pair of empty curly braces. Remember that sets are unordered, so we can write the elements any way we want. And observe the symbol here at the bottom uh, we, that we use to show that an element is a member of a set as red is an element of the set containing green and red. Notice that the examples on this slide, uh, we are not talking about sets of numbers. I use sets of colors as an example. Now often we'll need to talk about sets that are too big or too complicated to be described by listing all their elements. Set notation gives us more powerful tools for expressing sets. For example, we can define a set as a restriction on another set. In this case, we can define the natural numbers as a restriction on the integers. Inside the curly braces, it, uh, we have the area divided by a vertical bar, and we're going to see many uses of the vertical bar in, in this course. Uh, the left of that bar uh, indicates that any natural number, call it x, is an integer. So we can read that as uh, x in the set of integers, 
The right side says more specifically that we are talking only about such x as is greater than zero. So again, the set of natural numbers is uh, the set of, int uh, of elements x that are integers such that x is greater than zero. We'll see other specialized ways of defining specific sets as well. Uh, sometimes things that are convenient for specific sets that we're trying to, to define. Uh, some of them you already know, and we simply need to point out the fact that they are set notation, that they are there referring to sets. So remember interval notation from algebra and precalc. An interval is just a set after all. Uh, and interval notation is simply a way of defining one. So the interval 1 exclusive to 5 inclusive is just the set of numbers drawn from the reals that are greater than 1 and less than or equal to 5. Now all of this is a fair amount to take in, um, in in one sitting, so if all of this is new to you then you'll definitely want to take some time to review it before moving on. Make sure that you read sections 1.1 through 3 carefully if you haven't already. In the next video we will see more definitions about sets, uh, especially operations on them, uh, operations that are analogous to the arithmetic operations you would have learned in grade school.